So, yeah, as Robert mentioned, right, there people have been, been collecting data on phones for a long time. Right? Um, um, one of the unique things, I think, about what we've built as a technology company is, is not necessarily just that mechanism to communicate with huge numbers of people. Um, and huge number of people who, who I think, to some degree, from the previous presentations, uh, at least you know, many of their voices haven't been heard because they don't have regular access to the internet. Um, you know, so, I think this year uh, there's going to be over two billion mobile phones sold. And by the end of this year, we're talking about six billion uh, mobile phone subscriptions on the on the planet. This is we are literally witnessing kind of what has culminated into becoming the, the fastest technology adoption in human history. And um, while I think the internet is extraordinarily powerful uh, in terms of both as a data gathering mechanism as well as being able to glean insights, um, this ubiquity of mobile phones, especially in these understudied, underserved communities, um, you know, I, I think that this is a resource that needs to be leveraged. And ultimately, that's what's, um, why I've kind of stopped out of the academia and, and started a uh, what, what uh, a few years ago was kind of a side project and has now turned into a uh, $30 million uh, market research company that focus, focuses only on the developing world. Um, the, the rationale here for, for, for getting into this was, um, I mean, I think I want to do just two minutes or less, actually, on, on what, the, what the unique thing that we do is. And this came from my work um, teaching mobile application development at the University of Nairobi. So I, I was building lots of different projects using mobile phones and got involved with the Ministry of Health in Kenya. And what we did is we built an SMS blood bank system, a system um, that let rural nurses text in what the blood supply levels were in their remote hospitals across the country. Um, and we built this beautiful visualization, you know, my students and I, to, to, to allow the guys at the centralized blood banks in Kenya um, to see in real time you know, what the current blood supply levels are. So we're getting data back from these nurses all over the country in these remote areas and then displaying it in real time. And I thought this was a very clever solution. I mean, I was quite proud of myself of being able to build something, deploy it. And the first week, it got a ton of press. We had nurses from around the country texting in data. And it seemed like one of these things that ultimately was going to be a, you know, a big success. Now, that SMS blood bank um, was a total failure. I mean, it failed um, you know, because basically this, the week after that, about half the nurses stops texting in the data. And by about the end of the month, virtually no nurse in Kenya was giving us any more data. And it failed not because of any technical shortcoming. Technically, this platform was rock solid. It failed because of a fundamental lack of insight on my part. And that lack of insight had to do with the price of a text message. You know, if you're asking people to give you data from these ubiquitous mobile phones that aren't iPhones, right, that don't have data plans, ultimately, you're asking them to bear a cost. And the price of a text message represents a substantial fraction of a rural nurse's day's wage. So ultimately, we were asking these rural nurses across the country to take a pay cut in order to basically give us data so that we could build a better system. You now, that's something fundamentally is not fair, right? So what I did uh, was I built a little airtime rewards platform, a platform that let us provide very small increments of airtime to that rural nurse in exchange for giving us a properly formatted text message with the day's blood supply levels. Um, about 10 cents of air time, you know, enough to compensate the individual for the, for, the, uh, for the SMS and about one penny extra to kind of say thank you. And for the opportunity to earn one cent of air time, virtually every rural nurse re-engaged with the platform. You know, ultimately, it's led to far fewer, uh, a, a massive reduction in emergency blood transfusions across Kenya. But the bigger thing was that it ultimately left me led me to leave my job uh, and, and start a company. And so that little airtime reward platform that originally we built for the Ministry of Health in Kenya, it's now been integrated into the back-end billing systems of 232 mobile operators across almost 100 countries. And still, so instead of just being able to send small denominations of airtime to these rural Kenyan nurses, we can now not only communicate, but more profoundly, we can compensate 2.1 billion people in denominations literally as low as 10 cents. And that is, you know, that creates a platform that enables you to do unprecedented research, especially in underserved, understudied communities. So that's what this company is all about, and that's 
uh, to some degree, this is a little bit about what we're, um, you know, this one of our first projects really has been with Robert and his team here at Global Pulse to demonstrate the, the breadth that uh, of, of what a system like this can do. So we've, you know, we've done deals now with 232 mobile operators. We can deal with all sorts of uh, consumers. Uh, you know, we've been starting to try to figure out like, what kind of interesting questions do we want to ask. Um, you know, ranging from, you know, how long is your commute? Um, you know, we're asking, we're finding insights about about countries like, you know, Ni Nigerians love Nokia still. Um, they're very optimistic about their future. Things that aren't necessarily so surprising. Brazilians love to talk about soccer. Um, asking just kind of random questions. This was this was something that was actually inspired by Adam David. Adam Davidson wanted to um, ask what people would do. He's the host of Planet Money on NPR. And it's a, a, a radio show I listen to. Kind of with religious fervor, um, he he wants to uh, he wants to know what uh, you know, what people around the world would do with fifteen dollars. We could do information ranging from paying paying a dowry to putting it in a bank to you know if someone in Uganda wanted to buy a website. Um, you know some of the interesting insights that we got from this uh, the Global Pulse study. So we're looking to think uh, at you know country comparisons as we're asking people around the world these different questions. Um, looking at India, Indians are, are ten times as likely as, as people from Brazil to say that education is uh, what prevents them from finding them finding a better job, whereas uh, lack of lack of opportunity is, is in Brazil is kind of the dominant answer there. Um, um, so, you know, one of the the important things I think about. Um, the platform is that while we leverage the mobile web, I mean, in some instances, we, you know, these people can give us information, you know, this surveys through Facebook. Um, we, we push, we make sure that we can cater to these extremely low enhanced sites. And we do that not only through text messaging, but we have a proprietary protocol called Universal Cellular Messaging Protocol, which, sits, which tunnels into the USSD platform. And I can talk at length about that, but it's probably not that interesting. But the important thing is that it means that we can communicate with these people at no cost to them. So we can go push it, basically take over their, their low-end handset and push essentially a, a survey that they can answer through multiple choices. So they kind of navigate through these menus. And this works on a phone that you were using 10 years ago, you know, literally any GSM handset. Um, and, uh, and that makes it quite, uh, you know, quite unique. So on the research side of things, we're, we, we basically had our head down for the last uh, two and a half, three years building out this massively scalable platform. And, um, and what's interesting about this company is that we are, you know, actually, you know, we're 20 people, 19 of us are engineers, you know, so we don't have a sales team. Um, and yet we've got now, I think, mean, close to 80 clients that are, you know, in, the, in these like, massive global organizations. And what's, you, what's kind of common across these clients, and the UN included, is that they pay extraordinary amounts of money um, for, you know, research in these emerging markets. And they use what I consider the Land Rover methodology, right? So um, P&G is a client. They, uh, you know, until actually recently, they literally were flying people out to Manila, renting Land Rovers, driving out into the field, and conducting face-to-face -face surveys, asking rural Filipino women what they thought about laundry detergent. Like, we don't have to convince them that our platform scales better, that reaches far more people, right? We don't have to convince them that this is, this is a methodology that gets them data far quicker and far, with far less expense. You know, this is the why we don't have a sales team. Like, so we, um, you know, these, these massive corporations, as well as uh, large organizations, are, are coming to us. So we're, doing, we're trying to basically build out this research platform as fast as we can to, to keep up with the demand. And so we're scaling the, the products that we're offering, ranging from kind of targeted surveys, like what Robert was, was talking about, where we want to have perhaps a representative sample across dozens of countries. To um, you know, the World Bank right now is one of our largest uh, our largest clients, and what they're asking us to do is actually very similar to the very, the first topic. You know, we're doing uh, price collection, but instead of looking online at, for prices, what we're doing is we're actually sending people out to their rural markets, you know, in their own neighborhoods, and asking them what you know what does a kilo of rice actually cost. So um, you know, this I think is certainly not uh, something that will replace some of the other methodologies we've we've heard today. But at least it gives you perhaps a higher resolution uh, in terms of what the cost of a particular commodity is. You know, not just within a country, um, not just within a city, but actually within different neighborhoods of a, of a, of a place like Nairobi. So, um, and then finally, the omnibus. I think, uh, which is uh, which is basically what this Ask the World Global Pulse study was all about, was 
something where we're going out and we're asking people uh, on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, what you, questions related to access to health care, education levels, uh, estimates on, on well-being. And so, you know, at the moment what we've talked about is a static snapshot. But really what the Omnibus represents is something where we're going to be basically doing a large scale and when I say large scale, we're going to do the, the largest scale longitudinal cohorts study that's ever been accomplished. You know, we, we're, my hope is by the end of next year, we're going to have over three million people that we regularly are asking questions of. Um, and, uh, and that's pretty exciting. So, thank you.